Thank you. Thank you, the host. Um, and you'll handle introductions. Yeah. And greetings. So welcome again, everyone, to uh, this last session on Calvin's uh, political theology of exile uh, with Ruben. Um, I've gotten good feedback uh, from a number of you. And so I appreciate um, your time and attention, uh, no matter when you have uh, listened or watched this. Uh, and so we're going to begin tonight. I have a, another prayer from Calvin uh, that we can, we can pray our way into the session. So let us pray. Startle us, O oh God, with your truth. And open our hearts and our minds to your wondrous love. Speak to us. Silence in us any voice but your own. And be with us now as we turn our attention, our minds, and our hearts to your work among us. And Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank Take you. it away, Reuben. Uh, thank you. It's great to be here. Our final week together. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And... Um, it's a pretty horrific image, I know. Um, and it's it seems at least until recently, it seemed hard to believe that this was part of our, of our history. Um, and yet, uh, we know that in parts of this country, uh, lynchings were not only commonplace, but perfectly respectable members of society, good Christian men and women would attend these as they would a church picnic and would take pictures and would sell the pictures as postcards commemorating the event. Um, and so I begin with this image just to, to put things in, in, a, in a perspective, in a context, and, and to then help us move into uh, drawing critical resources from Calvin for resisting racism. Now, we're moving into a topic that Calvin didn't say much about because it, it really, race and racism as we know it today is a fairly modern invention. Um, but I did want to share these thoughts um, from Dr. King. It is appalling that the most segregated hour of Christian America is 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. And that is a that that continues uh, to this day. But when I say that that I'm moving into an area that Calvin didn't address specifically, I hope I'm not betraying Calvin as theologian and as Christian thinker. Um, Calvin was not a speculative theologian. He dealt with that were found within scripture and dealt with the whole of scripture carefully and systematically. Um, and so I'm going to try to make the case that if we begin within a certain dogmatic framework, namely um, what the scriptures say about how we relate to one another as human beings made in the image of God, we cannot help but address the issues and to take a, a, an advocacy stand, not a neutral stance on these questions. But at the heart of it is, is Calvin's um, understanding that involves justification, that which is done on the cross once and for all. Christ died for our sins on the cross, and that is outside of us. That is an objective gift from God. It's to the process of sanctification, of us uh, internally um, allowing the Holy Spirit to transform us and allow us to, to walk a path closer to God in the footsteps of Christ. And finally, that manifests itself in vocation, the Christian life. And so um, we find in Calvin um, that, that maybe the early Luther would, would not have been comfortable with. But we are not saved by works, yet not without works. Again, I'm just recapping some of the things we've talked about in the past few weeks, that there is a distinctly Calvin of life. 
and it is a practice, a spiritual practice of daily living as response to the grace of God. And it is through a life of faith and obedience. And and emphasize the Ten Commandments as guideposts, uh, as a roadmap, if you will, but always interpret it through the lens of the Gospels, and specifically the Sermon on the Mount. And from that reading of uh, the Ten Commandments as a model for the Christian life, he identifies four distinctive features of the Christian life. One is self-denial, uh, serving others, giving of ourselves for the sake of others, bearing the cross, recognizing that suffering is part of the Christian life, um, meditation on the future, keeping our, our eyes on the prize, on the goal, which is uh, uh, a perfect union with Christ and, and God in, in eternal life. But also recognizing that, that this life is good and meant to be enjoyed as well. And so Calvin was not a, a Gnostic, Calvin was not a, a denier of the material goods of this life. And so within his theological framework, there is room for the use and enjoyment of this present life. So all of these things inform our, our discussion on race and racism. Um, as we talked about last week, when we focused on immigration and the refugee crisis in Geneva, um, Geneva was a really diverse place. Um, the wars of religion, the persecution of Protestants throughout Europe um, made Geneva a haven for, for Protestants and, and evangelicals from France, Spain, Italy, Poland, Great Britain, Scotland, etc. Um, in Geneva, there were very few Jews and Muslims. Um, that being said, what can Calvin teach us about racism today? Well, First of all, we need to, to come to terms with the sad legacy of racism that has been linked to the Reformed theological tradition that was descended from Calvin. And in particular, I'm talking about the, the North Atlantic slave trade, which while begun by the Spanish and the Portuguese, once uh, the papacy ruled that Christians could not, uh, in good conscience, be slave traders, the Spanish and the Portuguese divested themselves of the slave trade and primarily um, taken over by the Dutch Reformed. Um, in the United States, um, Northern Presbyterians from very early on historically opposed slavery. Um, eventually, the Presbyterian Church in the, in, in the United States, once we were a, a, a sovereign nation, um, split between North and South over the issue of slavery. And then um, a, an interesting parallel, um, but also one deeply influenced by Reformed theology, was the apartheid, the rise of apartheid in South Africa in the late 19th and through the 20th century. Um, and so as, again, a, a theological tradition descended from, from Calvin, the, the Reformed churches have had to, to think long and hard about their legacy of racism. In the United States, Presbyterianism, as I mentioned, had st strong uh, role in uh, the abolitionist movement. In 1787, uh, as part of the um, process to ratify the U.S. Constitution, um, the synods of New York and Philadelphia voted to abolish slavery and did not want the three-fifths compromise uh, as part of the Constitution. Unfortunately, um, the state of New York nonetheless ratified it and joined the Union, but they were very vocal and had uh, a strong presence that continued well in, through the 19th century of, of abolition. And so in 1818, uh, they made a, a declaration, a statement, um, the Northern Presbyterians, um, about slavery. They defined it as a sin. They said that it was inconsistent with the laws of God, said that the practice of slavery was irreconcilable with the gospel, and that as Christians, we have a duty to work for the abolition of slavery. But of course, Southern Presbyterians responded with, with their own 
illogical argument defending slavery. They pointed to the fact that Abraham was a slave owner, the fact that the law of Moses did not abolish slavery but regulated it. Christ interacted with slaveholders without condemning them. That Paul, and here we get into something that's controversial and we'll talk about later, but that Paul exhorted slaves to obey their masters and runaway slaves to return and submit to their masters. So again, uh, like the divisions that we still come today, the Presbyterian church was, was divided and split over the issue of slavery. So how do we deal with this? What are the Calvinist resources? Um, I think I've, I've, I've set the stage over the last few weeks, but um, it's important to note that more than any theologian since Augustine, uh, Calvin, it throughout his writings, in, in his institutes, but in his commentaries and his sermons, gave more attention to the doctrine of the Mago Dei than any theologian since Augustine. This is, of course, the, the doctrine that says all of humanity created in the image of God, male and female, um, that what makes us image of God is, is basically a gift of grace. It's nothing we merit or earn or by virtue of um, traits. Calvin claims that considering the image of God in our fellow human beings is the foundation for doing justice. And here's a lengthy passage which I shared before from the Institutes, but again bears repeating. The Lord commands all men without exception to do good, yet the great part of them are most unworthy if they be judged by their own merit. But here Scripture helps in the best way when it teaches that we are not to consider that men merit of themselves, but to look upon the image of God in all men to which we owe all honor and love. Assuredly, there is but one way in which to achieve what is not merely difficult, but utterly against human nature, to love those who hate us, to repay their evil deeds with benefits, to return blessings for reproaches. Uh, here he's, he's drawing reference to the Beatitudes in the Gospel of Matthew. It is that we remember not to consider men's evil intentions, but to look the image of God in them, which cancels and effaces their transgressions, and with its beauty and dignity allures us to love and embrace them. So again, um, it is a, a theological argument grounded in grace, grounded in the gift uh, of, of God to um, be made in God, and therefore to recognize that our inherent worth as creatures, that our inherent dignity as human beings um, stems from this gift of grace. And so Calvin um, deals with the law and the gospel. But for Calvin, it is because of what Christ has done for us through this grace that, that we can now see the law, not as a burden like the Apostle Paul did before conversion, but as, as a, in fulfilling the, the fruits of that grace. Could I interrupt here real quick? Yes, please do. Uh, I just, uh, so I, I, I just recently read an essay by Dr. Hunzinger, George Hunzinger, on the evangelical as. Have you read that? I haven't. No, I'd like to. Um, so I was, I just, there's a paragraph here I was going to share just because I think it's, it's, it's um, he says, in the familiar golden rule as taught by Jesus, the standard of moral behavior derives from how we ourselves would like to be treated. Just as we do not wish to be treated unfairly by others, so we ought not to treat others unfairly. It's a matter of simple consistency. No one is entitled to an exemption from the duty to deal fairly with others, and everyone has some idea of fairness since we routinely invoke it in our case. The golden rule makes explicit what is implicit in or our ordinary judgments. It takes up the standard we use to judge how we ought to be treated and makes it universal for the sake of consistency. It derives the imperative, how we ought to treat others, from the optative, how we wish to be treated ourselves. The dominical as links matters like fairness with universality and consistency on the basis of ordinary self-regard due to others as you would have them do to you. 
When we turn to the evangelical as of Luther and Calvin, the frame of reference shifts. The standard of moral behavior derives not from how we would wish to be treated, but from how we were actually treated. It arises not from ordinary self-regard, but from God's unexpected regard for, of us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. According to the gospel, we are sinners who are not only met with undeserved grace, but are spared from deserved condemnation. The condemnation was borne by another who died that we might live. We were absolved by an act of unfathomable love, and therefore we love our neighbors. So. Yeah, that's right. And, and, uh, just so people know you're not making this up. No, no, I'm not. <laughs> Which then brings us to, to the, the challenge, right, of, of the fact that um, when Calvin dealt with differences between peoples, they were differences of nationality and politics or differences of religion. And in the 16th century, most Christians uh, treated those who were uh, Jews or Muslim as infidels. And those who were being encountered uh, as Europe began to colonize uh, Asia, Africa, and Latin America, those who had never heard of Christ or the gospel as heathen or pagans. And so it it's, doesn't strike us, right, as, as a very good model for, for a contemporary discussion. Um, but I think what, what's important to note is that um, in that context, for Calvin, the church and the role of the gospel was um, to create a, a very kind of cosmopolitan community in which local differences are respected, in which the manner in which people worship and, and celebrate and live the Christian life is determined locally, right? But nonetheless, um, once they have heard the gospel, um, once they have uh, embraced that that gift of grace, um, they're they're building the world in in the image of God's king, and therefore, it even though it didn't specifically speak about race, when I talked last week about uh, nationality and immigration, Calvin had this vision of a of a transnational church, of a truly global and ecumenical church, and and so to me that would lead as, as, as the modern world began, well, not just in terms of nationalities, but also in terms of race. Um, I think it would be reading of Calvin to then say that, that he would reject any kind of, of racial hierarchy or exclusion from the church based on race, just as he would based on nationality. Um, so, so how do we then address these issues well, we, we apply the, the hermeneutic he applied. Scripture is the primary source. Um, if you had to distill the gospel, it's, it's to love God and to love your neighbor. Um, the law is not a burden anymore, but it's, it's a, a uh, kind of an objective description of, of what that love of neighbor and love of God looks like. Calvin, like like many other theologians divided the Ten Commandments into the two tables, that which we, we offer to God in our, in our obedience to God, and that which we do for our neighbor in carrying out um, uh, God's commandments. And um, all of this, of course, is no longer beyond reach because it's been done for us. And so the Christian life is, is, is our uh, faithful response not to be morally perfect, but to do as best we can within our, our resources, that which God has commanded. And so I think that the prime example is Jesus' teaching on the sixth commandment, where, where he says, uh, thou shalt not murder. Once we, we read it through the lens of Jesus' preaching in the Sermon on the Mount, it's not enough to restrain from committing acts of physical violence to take someone else's life. But Calvin says in his commentary on the Sixth Commandment that if there's anything within our power that we can do to make our neighbor's life better, then we have a moral duty to do it. So if our neighbor's children are hungry, we ought to feed them. Um, if our neighbor has no shelter, we ought to house them. 
so forth and so on. And, and if we don't, much like Jesus said about adultery and looking at, at, at a, a person of the opposite success, sex through, through the eyes of lust, he's basically saying, if we don't do these things, feed those who are hungry, shelter those who are homeless, it's as if we committed murder. And, and to some, that will seem like an even heavier burden than the law. But again, understanding, as, as Jason just pointed out, quoting Hunsinger, it, it's because we have been freed from the law, that, that because we recognize that we are all under grace, that, that then we can live life as Christ lived. I was reading Calvin's commentary on uh, Matthew 22 and the greatest commandment mm -hmm. um, uh, over the weekend, actually. And, and Calvin makes the point in there um, that like the love of neighbor starts with your actual neighbor um, yeah. because, because, because otherwise if it's, you know, a broad category or love the world or this issue or this people group, um, it's, it's too easy to, to exempt yourself from, from getting actually involved. And, and he, he says something similar in the commentary on Deuteronomy on, on the Decalogue. Um, you, you can't fake love of neighbor, but you can fake love of God. You can give your offering. You can say your prayers loudly and sing hymns and, you know, but when it comes right down to it, when you physically have to coexist and interact with the neighbor who's right there in the pew next to you or in your community, um, you can only for so long before you're found out human nature being what it is. So, yeah. Um, let me see. There we go. But in all of this, as a big specter, is, is, is the fact that, that the critique of the pro-slavery Southern preachers was legitimate to a degree, insofar as Jesus never condemned slavery explicitly or slave owners explicitly. And so we have to, to, to deal with this. And we have to look at the fact that in the Mosaic Law, there's no explicit condemnation of slavery um, and we find as as the southern preacher said it, it regulates right slavery neither shall you desire your neighbor's house or field or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything else that belongs to your neighbor in other words it, it deals with slavery uh, as it deals with with oxen and donkeys right property that belongs to your neighbor and that's that's should make you very uncomfortable um, now, admittedly, the Mosaic Law does demonstrate compassion towards slaves, and you can't make them work on the Sabbath, and you have to, you know, treat them with a certain level of, of human decorum. Um, but nonetheless, human beings are property. And of course, the argument could be made, well, compared to slavery in ancient Rome, uh, slavery in, in uh, Old Testament Judaism was more humane. Um, it was not a lifelong enslavement. Um, there was a, a, a year of Jubilee every seven years. Anyone who was enslaved would be set free. Um, under Roman law, the sale of slaves was no different than the sale of animals. Um, according to Roman law, slaves were promised freedom at the age of 30 but there's little historical evidence that this law was ever enforced. And when you consider that the average lifespan was about 35 years, it, um, you know, not surprising. And then uh, what's most troubling is that in some ancient texts, a slave was referred to as an instrumentum vocale, a talking tool. But I think if we really want to understand world of the New Testament, we need to look to the intertestamental literature and, and Hellenistic Judaism and uh, the books of the Apocrypha. And here in the book of Sirach, we find the fall, again, quite disturbing. Fodder, thick and burdens for a donkey, bread and discipline and work for a slave. Set your slave to work and you will find rest. 
leave his hands idle and he will seek liberty. Yoke and thong will bow the neck, and for a wicked slave there are racks and tortures. Put him to work in order that he may not be idle, for I teach as much evil. Set him to work as is fitting for him, and if, he's do if he does not obey, make his fetters heavy. Now, I know we as Protestants can hide under the, the, the fact that, okay, this isn't New Testament canon. This is the Apocrypha. But, but nonetheless, this gives you an insight into the, the worldview in which Jesus was born and preached. And then it raises questions as to, well, how did Jesus refer and interact with slavery? Jesus repeatedly makes references to slaves and slavery in his preaching. Um, it's an image throughout. No slave can serve two masters. Um, but he uses slavery to illustrate stories and parables and therefore reveals a familiarity with the everyday lives of slaves. And yet, none of the gospel's narratives ever depict Jesus in conversation with slaves. And this is always, as a, as a theologian and scholar, has always troubled me. And so I, I have to ask why. Why did Jesus never question the morality of slavery? And you put it in the context of all of his other preaching and interactions, and it seems very suspicious. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus transgresses numerous social boundaries. He interacts with the Samaritan women. He interacts with the Roman centurion, with tax collectors, with lepers, with the woman caught in adultery. So considering that Jesus often utilized marginalized and excluded persons to challenge and transform existing social prejudices, why did Jesus never question the morality of slavery? Why is he never depicted in conversation or table fellowship with slaves in the way he is with Gentiles, with prostitutes, with tax collectors? I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a moment because I'd like to, to have a conversation about that. Um, what, what do people think? And... Uh, Make Will we be able to, to interact with Foundation or? Yeah, can you uh, make me the host again? I will uh, yep. bring them in here. Uh, there we go. Um, entering the, the forum, I just want to rephrase the question. In other words, Given how Jesus interacted with people who were marginalized and excluded and did so to, to very clearly transform certain prevalent prejudices, why do we never see Jesus question the morality of slavery? And why do we never see Jesus in conversation with the slave in the same way he had conversations with tax collectors, uh, Gentiles, prostitutes? Any the real, like, and you you better have your own answer at I the do. end of that. <laughs> I, <'Cause> do. I <laughs> because I don't. I, I don't understand with the love your neighbor, and we're all created in the image image of God. Um, I don't quite understand how that would ever exclude a slave unless they weren't considered and created in the image of God. Pam, I, I have to agree with you. I mean, as a, as a theologian, that, that is what, what really drove me on this issue. And anyone who's, who's done a study of early Christianity, and, and perhaps the, the text that really opened my eyes was Wayne Meek's book, um, The First Urban Christians. And, and the truth is that Christianity um, spread throughout all the strata of life and, and, and culture and society from the very rich to the very poor. 
but it was an overwhelmingly popular movement among slaves. So again, part of me raises the question, well, what are they hearing? Why are they feeling welcomed and embraced um, where there at the same time seems to be no explicit condemnation of slavery? I, I think someone else, uh, Debbie, and then Steve. Yeah. Um, so uh, what struck me on the list of people that uh, Jesus spoke to, it seems that those were people who had been marginalized, but could, had some control over making a change. The woman at the well, um, the uh, woman caught in adultery, the tax collector, those, those were folks who, who could make a change. And so to me, it, when we say, why didn't he you know, sit down and talk to the slaves or why was he not, it, maybe it was really to their owners that he was having the discussions because they were the ones who needed to have a, a change of heart. And, and yet we find very little. Right. You know, he doesn't, as, as the Southern preachers pointed out, he, he never yeah. took issue with the slaveholders. Right. So I, I, mean, I have some responses to that, but I want to hear from Steve, who had his hand up. Yes, Ruben, I just had a question. Um, did Calvin or during that time, was there any distinction made between African slaves and Caucasian slaves? That, that's actually a, a very good point. Um, that's one of the, the greatest kind of myths of, of the Southern preachers is, is the notion that the curse of Ham, right? that yeah. sub-Saharan Africans were being punished as the descendants of Ham. There is, that is nowhere in the Bible. Read the text and read the, the story of Noah and his sons. And the curse of Ham has, has, has nothing to do with, with color of skin, with national identity. Um, that was simply a way of interpreting the text to justify the North Atlantic slave trade. Um, St. Augustine, and then his influence on Western Christianity runs deep, did say that the punishment was that, that the descendants of Ham would be the servants or slaves of, of the other two brothers. And so he says that the punishment was enslavement, and therefore, as a Roman and a Roman citizen, Augustine uh, did not, was not an abolitionist, right? Did not condemn slavery because he saw it as something instituted by God, okay? As troubling as that is, that's still a far cry from saying that, that you know, the enslavement of Africans was a punishment from God, right? Um, and the truth is that, that in Europe, the word slave enters from, from Slavic, from the Slavs, and, and the Eastern Slavs who were enslaved in Europe. So at one point, slavery was not based on, on racial identity. That, that came later in, in European history. Um, but it is troubling, right? And it is troubling that it's not until the fourth century with Gregory of Nyssa, one of the Cappadocian fathers, that we finally have an explicit condemnation within the late Roman Empire of, of slavery. And it comes he argues, from that doctrine of the Imago Dei. So, so, so okay. Yes. It's, uh, it's, but, but there were periods earlier in the church where private property was, was not allowed for Christians. That's right. So, so that, like, so, so, like, were, were slaves included in that? Uh, that's an interesting tension, right? Um, slaves were, were members of the church. And in the church, they were embraced as brothers and sisters in Christ. But they were, if their owner was Christian, we don't know if their owners were encouraged to free the slaves. Mm -hmm. And we know for a fact that if their owners weren't Christians, the early church was not involved in, in an abolitionist movement to free them. Right? Mm -hmm. They accepted and tolerated slavery. Which brings us then to the text of, of uh, Philemon, Paul's letter Philemon, right? And this was the story that was um, used both by abolitionists and by uh, pro-slavery 
um, in the 19th century here in this country. And, and the gist of it is Onesimus was a runaway slave. He'd been baptized a Christian by Paul and was helping Paul in his ministry. We don't know how he ended up with Paul. Um, but Paul is writing to uh, Philemon, who owns Onesimus. Um, we know that the Roman law demanded that runaway slaves be returned to their owners. And we also know that Paul, throughout his letters, always emphasizes two things. One, that he, he was a Roman citizen, right? And the other, that um, we ought to respect the ruling authorities, right? And so Paul writes to Philemon, and what he says is, Though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do your duty, yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love. And then he tells Philemon that you should welcome him back as a brother, not as a slave, right? But as a brother. And then, if you really want to do the right thing, send him right back to me because he's been a great big help to me in my ministry. So, so it's interesting that, that Paul, because he's, he's always navigating, keep in, fact, in mind that he was always someone who, who was in constant trouble with, with the Roman authorities because of his uh, evangelical mission, um, nonetheless, is, is kind of walking this fine line, right? He, he doesn't say, now that he's a baptized Christian, you need to set him free. But he does say, hey, you forget who I am. I'm the one who baptized you. I'm the apostle, right? And, you know, read between the lines. Um, but what's interesting is that slave traders, um, pro-slavery Christians, appealed to this letter to, to defend the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. Why? Because in the end, even if Paul wanted Onesimus freed, Paul returned the slave to Philemon. Um, abolitionist Christians use this text to emphasize the fact that, that what Paul is saying is that once you're baptized in Christ, uh, you are equal, you are brothers in Christ, and therefore is commanding Philemon to, to welcome him, not as a slave, but as a brother in Christ, therefore to set him free and return him to Paul as, as, a, as a minister in Christ. Mm -hmm. That's the tension. But again, even here, it's not explicit. And you can see how the text has been manipulated in, in both ways. It is interesting to note, though, that, that the, the only explicit condemnation uh, of slavery in the New Testament is in 1 Timothy 1.10, where slave traders are included on a list of those who are lawless, uh, probably because they acquired slaves illegally, not because of how they treated them and not because of the, the fact they own slaves, but that they, they had likely um, procured the slaves through kidnapping or some other illegitimate uh, way. But, but, but that's about it, right? Or one would think. So, uh -huh. so was, the, was the appeal of, of Christianity to slaves in ancient Rome then? I think a big part um, of it was the dignity, the fact that... Uh, here was a place in society where you'd be elbow to elbow, face to face at the communion table with owners and masters. Well, and I was even thinking, and freed people. I was even thinking, I mean, so if, if you know, so if you think like, you know, a lot of Paul's letters predate the gospels themselves, mm -hmm. like what, what slaves are hearing isn't the gospel of John. What they're hearing That's is right. Paul citing the the christ hymn in philippians that that yeah. the maker of heaven and earth assumed a form just like that slave over there mm -hmm. that's right and and no longer jew or greek male or female rich or poor slave or free right um and and i think that's that's an important piece um but even in the gospels i think in the end there are traces and so how i respond to this tension and I think I do so as a, as a, as a fairly consistent Reformed theologian in my thinking who begins and ends with Scripture. Um, we need to, to begin with uh, the preaching of Jesus himself, and, and specifically a text that has been very popular with liberation theologians, and that is Luke chapter 4, the first time Jesus preached in the synagogue in Nazareth. 
right? And he reads this passage from Isaiah 11. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. I've come to bring deliverance to the captives, right? Sight to the blind, so forth, so on. And then he concludes by saying, on this day, this scripture has been fulfilled. And if you read the story, um, there's a discussion about the role of Gentiles in this prophecy. And he cites a, another Old Testament story in which uh, one of the prophets comes to a Gentile and then the people of are angry and they chase him out of the synagogue to the edge of town where there's a cliff and they want to push him off to his death. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus survives and walks away. What I find surprising is, is, is that he begins with that passage, bring deliverance to the captives. Um, he's not talking about the Babylonian captivity. It's, it's a direct reference to the Exodus. And who were the captives? It was enslaved Israel. And so it was, and it could be read as, as a call to, to end slavery. And so, again, I'm also a liberationist as well as a Reformed theologian. And I do think that we need to look at the canon often with a critical eye and recognize that what we have aren't the words of Jesus. They are the words of, of, of the church redacted generations and that um, in the first and second centuries, there were no abolitionists. Slavery was an ugly and very real important part of the Roman Empire and its economic well-being and that if anyone would have tried to to put an end to that uh, they would have met with a lot of resistance if you're then a persecuted religious minority within that context and you're explicit and vocal about ending slavery and you're already being persecuted you can imagine how that would step up and increase the persecution and so it would not surprise me if if jesus had had more explicit comments to make or if there had been more direct interaction with Jesus and slaves or Jesus and slave owners that he'd been critical of and, and that those had been kind of excised from, from the Gospels. There's no evidence. You can't trace it. Um, but nonetheless, the, the Exodus narrative is, is the, the central narrative of Israel. And Jesus was a Jew. And Jesus um, began public preaching ministry with that passage and to me that's that's not a coincidence so again i think there is there is enough there in light of um the fact that christianity spread among slaves and the fact that if you then read the criticisms from the roman pagan culture and here we have to rely on origins contra Celsum which was a, a debate, a response to a second century uh, pagan philosopher named Celsus, um, who his basic criticism of Christianity was this, that it was a religion for the simple, the lowly, the foolish, the slaves, old women, and little children. Right? And so, so we recognize then that, that those who are oppressed, those who are marginalized, this religion... Um, appealed to them. But as I said, explicitly, it wasn't until the fourth century in Gregory of, of Nyssa who made the argument that slavery violates the characteristics of the human being as created in the image of God. And this is what he had to say about it. You condemn a person to slavery whose nature is free and independent. And in doing so, you lay down a law in opposition to God, overturning the natural law established by him. For you subject to the yoke of slavery one who was created precisely to be a master of the earth and who was ordained to rule by the creator as if you were deliberately attacking and fighting against the divine command. And it's the same appeal that we find in Calvin, right? That, that anything that violates the image of God in another human being, which is that by ourselves um, worthy of, as 
human beings uh, in God's image, worthy of our inherent dignity, um, that gift of grace, then, then we have to recognize that anything which detracts from that uh, image is, is against God's command. Um, and again, this, this can manifest itself in, in a lot of different ways, um, but I think applied to the issue of, of race and the issue of, of the history of, of slavery, um, I think you're right that it was Debbie who uh, pointed out that it would then entail saying that a black slave in, in the 1800s was not a human being. Now, they might never have explicitly said that, but I think that's at the heart of, of a lot of people's theology and a lot of people's thinking. And I can draw a parallel contemporary of Calvin, namely the, the uh, friar Bartolomé de las Casas, the Dominican friar in the New World, in his defense of the indigenous peoples of the New World. Um, because the argument was made by Catholic theologians that they were enslaved and, and properly so. And they made an appeal to Aristotelian philosophy. And in Aristotle, there are two kinds of slave. There are slaves by nature, those who are born inferior and therefore we can enslave them. And those who become slaves in, in, the, in the process of a just war and the, the defeated enemy of a just war according to the Western theological tradition, can then become a slave. Um, Bartolomé de las Casas stood against both of those. He basically said, no, these are fully human beings with a rich culture, language, religion. In fact, he argued that the work of the Spirit had been at work in these indigenous cultures, preparing them for the gospel when, when the Christians came. Um, and then he argued that what the conquistadors had done was not a just war by any stretch of the imagination, but a brutal conquest um, driven by greed and by gold and by the desire to, to enslave and make a profit. So again, people of Calvin's age were making that argument grounded in the Imago Dei um, against slavery. Um, and again, when Calvin deals with these issues, unfortunately, he deals with them in the context of the, of the scriptures. And it's a different historical time period. Uh, slavery was not a reality of, of 16th century Geneva, but it was a, a reality um, uh, as they started uh, supporting missions in the New World, as uh, they started spreading Christianity and if not Calvin directly, but Calvin's descendants and Calvinism uh, to Africa. And um, there's been both good and, and bad strains of reformed theological thought. I think we, we can never forget that, yes, apartheid was, was a form of Dutch reformed theology, but so was the struggle against apartheid and the theological voices of white and black Africans working together, uh, Alan Bozak being perhaps the, the most influential reformed Af uh, black African theologian um, of the apartheid era. Um, but there were others. And then you had people like, like the Gucci, who was a white African theologian and also very much part of a struggle to, to defeat and overcome apartheid. Um, so, so again, there is nothing inherently pro-slavery or pro-racism about Calvinism. That's the point I'm trying to make, that, that yes, there is a, a, an embarrassing legacy in history, um, but there's also within the theological tradition a, 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 a vast amount of rich theological resources from which to resist racism. I don't know if I've raised more questions than, than I have provided answers, but uh, I do want to, I did want to spend some time dealing with these issues. Again, I presented them in, in such a way because I feel like, like in the end, um, part of the historical problem that the church has had to deal with on issues of slavery and how that related to racism, et cetera, is because 
the church was silent about slavery uh, early on. And, and it wasn't until hundreds of years later that, that the church was more explicitly a condemning of the practices of slavery. But what I find interesting is, is that clearly that the theological sources were there. The theological arguments were already there. Uh, what allowed uh, Gregory of Nyssa to be vocal? Well, uh, the, the breakdown of, of the empire and the split of the empire between East and West and um, the excesses of, of, of that he was witnessing in, in the East in Constantinople and um, the need to, to reform Christian practice there, um, I think gave him the, the courage to, to be more explicit uh, about the, the extremes of, of this kind of behavior within a supposedly Christian nation. Um, Ruben, I don't, I, I want to respect your time, but um, before we wrap up, uh, I know as a pastor uh, in a predominantly white denomination, um, at least in this country, um, one of the biggest challenges in talking about racism is the insistence by Christians that yes, racism exists possibly, but but I but it doesn't, uh, you know, I'm not implicated in it. And so I'm wondering, yeah. uh, you know, I'm wondering if you could explain for uh, those who are here or those who are watching later or listening, uh, what Calvin's understanding of total depravity was uh, uh, and, and how, yeah. how that actually provides uh, a, a way of understanding uh, our collective guilt and responsibility well i i think it's it's the sense that that very kind of argument you just described is is an attempt to justify ourselves before god and therefore um is is ill considered because in the end uh, when when you begin with grace and you begin from the premise that we're all sinners and that none of us is deserving of the forgiveness we receive through Christ, then you have to accept that that the human condition is what it is, because if even if we don't directly contribute to it, we've all benefited from it. We've all taken advantage of it. I think, I think, uh, I think the best way of looking at it is is the way H. R. Niebuhr argued about original sin. He didn't see it as this kind of genetic. Uh, inheritance or this kind of virus type contagion rather is the fact that um, whenever we find human beings inevitably you know given the choice between obedience to god and disobedience humans tend to to disobey and therefore um, we we have over generations and generations are, are, are implicated in structures that that yeah we might have had nothing to do uh, with their establishment but whether we acknowledge it or not we we have benefited from them um, so, you know same could be said about about men and in a patriarchal society right and and i just read a, an article um that women who have outstanding grades straight a's uh, as a predictor for future success compared to men men with failing grades and women with straight a's have an equal level of success years down the road right and, and why is that well because it, we are it, it, living in a society in which maleness is 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 inherently accepted as an indicator of of uh, superiority. No matter how mediocre the particular man may be by virtue of being a man, he's already benefiting from a sinful structure, from, from an unjust relationship. And, and sin is such that, that, again, the Christian response isn't to then say, you know, who's guilty and who's not guilty. It's, it, it begins with the recognition that reprobate humanity is the recognition that us can justify ourselves before God. And therefore, if the system is broken, then we shouldn't try to 
to be defending it. We should simply recognize if if anything defaces the image of God in another human being, you know, whether I had anything to do with it or not, the fact that that I'm forgiven despite not having done anything to merit that forgiveness, then then demands a, a similar level of, of grace and compassion towards others, rather than than judging them as to whether or not they might have contributed to their lot in life. Let's talk about poverty. You know, oh, that person could have worked harder or this or that. Well, you know, it's, it's a complex issue, and, and the realities of poverty are systemic and, and, and hereditary and over time, etc. But but the point is, if, if someone is, is hungry, you don't sit there and, and evaluate whether or not they're deserving. You feed them. I don't know if that gets to your question, Jason, but I think it's the best, best I can do. <laughs> no, I, I think I think that does. Um, can I ask a question? You may, so, ma'am. Thank you. May I? So yes, so what you're saying, I totally agree. I think it, it does it ultimately just come down to God or loving like God does, like he loved us so much that we would automatically know that that slavery we we didn't need jesus to say it because he showed us what love is and if we loved like he loved us then we wouldn't engage in those type of things i mean he gave he gives us a choice he gave adam and eve a choice and they chose based on the temptations they encounter but um, I mean, ultimately, I think it comes down to how much we know God, and how much we love him enough to to do what to love like him. So that would ultimately help us help us know be to, uh, or, or distinguish between right and wrong. Uh, I think I think where, where Calvin would, would I don't fine know. tune I, what I, you said <laughs> is simply to say that, yeah, but before Christ, before we we have an assurance of our own salvation. Um, we wouldn't even know we were in sin, right? Whereas now, uh, through the lens of, of Scripture, he called Scripture like corrective lenses. We can see the world as it is, and we can see that that we are forgiven not because of any virtue or merit on our part, but because of the nature of God to be a loving and merciful God. And, and that's why we then ought to forgive others and not to love others. And, and I think that the prayer Jason started with um, was, I, I loved it. It was very rich. And it reminds me of the fact that, yeah, we hear in Calvin all this language like reprobate humanity, et cetera. But, but there's also a great joy there. That was clearly a prayer written by someone who, who believes to be, that, that they've been forgiven. Not that they've been, not that they've been made perfect and therefore self-righteous, but that they have been forgiven and therefore can can try to live a life of obedience with joy rather than 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 that anguish that Luther experienced before discovering grace where 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 he really was angry at God because God made these demands and and no matter how hard he tried to live up to them he never could right he had this kind of existential crisis um Luther and Calvin um both begin then with the joy of the gospel, the good news, the recognition that now we're not burdened with, with a new set of laws, but rather now we're freed to, to live life as God intended. And that's a kind of a very different outlook. Something that wasn't possible before, loving our neighbor, is now possible. Why? Well, because it's it's Christ is living through us in some way. We are participating in the life of Christ, and and while we're far from perfect, and we'll make poor choices, um, we strive to be faithful and and obedient. And, and God works with us and helps us to grow and keeps us on that path. Well, and that's. Um, I, there's there's sort of an assumed 
atheism in the way we think about things often right um and so like you know we 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 wonder like well what do i have to do as a christian for god rather than well like jesus is alive and and in the gospel show like he loves to delegate things um and, and so yeah. like you know like we're, we're, you know like um so you know by by virtue of the resurrection like you're going to find yourself doing things um and and these texts kind of give you an idea of 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 how you're to go about doing it um or how you discern whether it's something jesus is telling you to do uh, does that make sense i i definitely uh, think you're you're right there um I like we, like we struggle we struggle with a christian ethics that that assumes a dead jesus it it yeah it it, it assumes and here maybe I, I get into the mystical maybe, but but it, it assumes that it's a Kantian, you know, secular ethic, which is yet another form of the law, which is here are your moral imperatives, you know, and, and you need to obey. It's a duty. And if you don't meet your duty, then then you are you failed. Um, that's not the gospel. Right. And, and, and so part of the problem is we we still view it as the, the, the autonomous human being um, carrying out some duty to bring about salvation. And, and that's, you know, we, we, we separated the moral from, from the life of, of, of worship and prayer and um, and even the, the, the sacramental nature of it. Um, th there is in, in, in Calvin uh, a, a fascination with Bernard of Clairvaux, the medieval monastic theologian, mystical theologian, and his book of books, book of love, and, and he wrote works of love. I think it was a book of love. I don't remember now, but but he, he wrote extensively on, on Bernard of Clairvaux. And there's this passage in Bernard of Clairvaux that always gets me. And he talks about the fact that um, as believers, we are but a drop of water. And when we are united with Christ, it's like that drop has fallen into the ocean. We're still water. We don't lose our sense of, of being part of the bigger whole as this drop of water. But... Our proper place is put in a di very different perspective when we surrender that sense of self to something greater and bigger than us. And it can be a little intimidating, I think, for, for modern believers in particular to lose our sense of control and autonomy. And it's one thing to, to talk about it abstractly, but it's another um, to live your life trusting in a way that... Um, well, to submit ourselves to the discipline of the church. How many of us do that, right? Calvin, uh, his understanding of, of the Christian life was such that there are some people who are more spiritually mature than others, who have been prepared by God to, to help others on that journey. And how many of us would submit our lives to our pastor as someone who we trust is more spiritually mature than us, to, to help us discern life decisions. I mean, on that level alone, a lot of people do, but many don't. And and as a, as a, as a former parish pastor, nothing shocked me to the core more than once. And I was maybe 26, 27 years old when one of the elders of my church, a man about 15 years older than I was, said to me one day, you know, Reuben, you have to realize that the people of this church and this town look to you um, as their spiritual director. And that blew me away because I had been three, four years removed from seminary, right? I was at the age of 25, um, and I had never properly considered that dimension of my vocation and my calling. And yet, as the older I get, the more I realize that you know, right? especially reading someone like Calvin, that that's a big part of why the church exists. And yet we don't do it. 
you have just two more minutes, um, Jason, did you ever study with Diogenes Allen? The philosopher? I, I took a, mm -hmm. yeah. Allen in one of his books on spiritual theology had this great little passage where he said that, that his church was holding a silent auction and, you know, people who had, who were dentists would offer a free teeth cleaning or whitening. Uh, people who had money and belonged to the country club would offer free golf lessons or whatever. And so one year as, as a lark, he, he submitted to the silent auction, um, a free, uh, spiritual assessment. He and his knowledge as a theologian, a philosopher, and an ordained Christian minister would provide a, a spiritual assessment of, of your spiritual well-being at this point in your life and maybe uh, provide needed uh, advice and, and guidance moving forward. Needless to say, no one bid on it um, <laughs> in, the, in the silent auction. But but for him, that that says a lot. It's, it's, it's him that was very insightful. Even though he meant it tongue-in-cheek, he really was, was saying something about modern Christianity and where how we live in a world where, where everyone assumes a medical doctor is an expert on what keeps a body ticking. No one assumes uh, a pastor is an expert on the spiritual health of human beings. And, and mm -hmm. that's a problem. As a church, we fail, according to Calvin. And mm -hmm. so I, that's why I wanted to put all of our moral thinking in that context that that we are forgetting that that part of this process of being a christian is allowing something outside of us namely god to shape us and help us grow and help us change and part of our resistance is because god often chooses vessels that that we don't recognize as better than us or authoritative in any way and so it's part of its pride right Anyway, I just thought I'd share that because that, that's always struck with me that, um, yeah, no one, no one wanted to bid on a, on a personal spiritual assessment to their, to their detriment because Diogenes Allen was, was a very wise man. So, Ruben, did anybody, did anybody what? bid on the free trip to heaven? <laughs> that would have been, yeah, I'm sure they would have. It would be the equivalent of a, of a, uh, oh, what was that? Uh, now I'm blanking the uh, what Luther was up in arms about the, the sale of uh, indulgences. Yeah, it would be a, the modern equivalent of an indulgence, I guess. <laughs> All right. uh, Ruben, I want to thank you so much for your time these last four weeks. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I just uh, can you, you uh, would you mind praying uh, to close this out? No, no, not at all. Let us pray. Most loving and gracious God, we give you thanks for this opportunity to have fellowship despite the pandemic, despite the geographical distance. We thank you for this opportunity to know that we are not alone. That community continues even in new ways. And Lord, we pray and give thanks for the foundation of all community, which is your love manifest through Christ, who died on the cross for us to give us new life. We continue to walk in his footsteps, and we continue to trust in your word to help us discern which path to take. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.